So let's look at questions. So the first question is asking, explain why moist blue litmus paper is bleached when it is put in a gas jar containing sulfur 4 oxide while dry litmus paper is not bleached. So why is it that a moist blue litmus paper will be bleached immediately when placed in a gas jar full of sulfur 4 oxide while a dry uh, litmus paper or a dry litmus paper will not show any effect when placed in a gas jar full of sulfur 4 oxide. So you see that the sulfur oxide contained in the gas jar will dissolve in the water uh, found on the litmus paper. So the litmus paper is moist. So since it is moist, it will mean that it has some traces of water. So what happens is that the sulfur oxide gas is going to react with this water in the litmus paper. So as it reacts with this water in the litmus paper, it is going to form an acidic medium. So it is going to form an acidic medium, which is sulfuric acid. So the sulfuric acid formed will then dissociate, forming hydrogen ions and sulfur 4 oxide ions. So the sulfate ions that will be formed are oxidized while the dye is reduced to a colorless material immediately. And since we have now the hydrogen ions that were also formed, so the hydrogen ions are the ones which will then be able to change the blue litmus paper color from blue to a red color, as this indicates the presence of an acidic medium. So remember, what's the definition of an acid? So an acid, this is any substance which contains replaceable hydrogen ions. If you dissociate sulfuric acid, remember you're going to have hydrogen ions and you're going to have the sulfate ions. Now these hydrogen ions in sulfuric acid represents that sulfuric acid is an acidic uh, rather represent that sulfuric acid is acidic and blue litmus paper in the presence of an acid will change color to red so in this case if we use a, a moist blue litmus paper the acid is going to dissociate to hydrogen ions and the sulfate ions so the hydrogen ions are the ones which will change the litmus paper from blue to red the sulfate ions on the other hand are going to bleach the litmus paper because remember we say that if sulfate ions react with water, we are going to get sulfuric acid. So that sulfuric acid is going to bleach the dye. So, uh, so after it has bleached, the dye will see that the litmus paper is going to change color from blue to red, and then soon it is going to discolorize, or soon the color red is going to fade away, because uh, this represents that sulfate ions are present. So if we use a dry litmus paper, there'll be no formation of any ions. There'll be no formation of hydrogen ions or sulfate ions. And this process can never take place. There won't be any hydrogen ions to change the blue litmus paper to red. There won't be any sulfate ions to discolorize or bleach the, the dye in the blue and the red litmus papers. So the second question is asking, a piece of old newspaper which had turned brown was moistened and placed in a gas jar containing sulfur 4 oxide. State and explain the observations made. So first of all, you see that the color of the newspaper will change from brown to colorless. So this is because the moist sulfur 4 oxide reduces the brown dye to a colorless compound. Remember the bleaching effects of sulfur 4 oxide that we went through in the chemical properties of sulfur 4 oxide. So sulfur oxide has a very powerful bleaching effect apart from chlorine. So let's go to question number three is asking, solid M is suspected to contain sulfate ions. Describe the steps that will follow to show the presence of sulfate ions in the solid. So what are the steps you are going to follow in order to determine that these ions contained here, they are sulfate ions. So remember the test for sulfate and the sulfite ions whereby uh, first of all, we react with barium, uh, with barium chloride, and then we react with an acid being hydrochloric acid or uh, nitric acid. So if the white precipitate persists, we'll know that it's sulfate. If white precipitate dissolves, we'll know that it is sulfate. So the first step is add solution to solid M to make, uh, to make it a solution. So I wish I said add a liquid, add water to solid M to make a solution. So add some traces or, or little amount of one or one centimeter cubed of water uh, in order to make solid M in a solution form. So after that, we say that to the solution, add equal amounts of barium chloride or barium nitrate to the solution dropwise. So after that, the next step will say, add dilute nitric acid or you can use hydrochloric acid. 
add dilute nitric acid or hydrochloric acid and make observation uh, in the white precipitate that was formed. So if after adding the hydrochloric acid, the white precipitate persists, it will mean that uh, we have sulfate ions present. If the white precipitate will dissolve, it will mean that we have sulfite ions present. But in this case, the question is asking, describe a method by which you can be used to determine uh, if we have sulfate ions present. So first of all, we'll dissolve solid M with water. After that, add equal amounts of barium chloride solution to the, uh, to the liquid. So after that, observe for the formation of white precipitate if white precipitate will be formed. After that, to the white precipitate, add equal amounts of hydrochloric acid and make observations. If the white precipitate persists, barium, uh, if the white precipitate uh, rather persists, it, persist, it will mean that sulfate ions are present. And that is that. That is just how to determine for the presence of the sulfate ions in this experiment. So after that, let's go to question number four. So the question number four is asking, the presence of nitrogen and sulfur oxide causes environmental pollution. So you see that nitrogen oxide react with sulfur oxide according to the equation below. So according to this equation. So nitrogen oxide reacts with sulfur oxide according to this equation, whereby we're going to get sulfur six oxide uh, and nitrogen, sulfur six oxide and nitrogen, nitrogen two oxide, which is NO. So the first question is asking, identify the reducing agent in this reaction. So the reducing agent in this reaction is sulfur four oxide. So sulfur four oxide is the one which is reducing nitrogen four oxide. And as well, it is being oxidized from being sulfur four oxide to sulfur six oxide. So the sulfur four oxide is reducing nitrogen four oxide from being nitrogen four oxide to being nitrogen two oxide. So identify the reducing agent in this reaction. So the reducing agent in this reaction is sulfur four oxide gas, which reduces nitrogen four oxide from nitrogen four oxide to nitrogen two oxide. So sulfur four oxide is the reducing agent. So question letter B is asking, state two effects of acid drain. So the acid drain can be obtained when carbon four oxide reacts with water in the atmosphere to form carbonic acid, or it can also be formed uh, when sulfur four oxide reacts with atmospheric, uh, atmospheric moisture or water to form sulfurous and then sulfuric acid, which will fall down as acid drain. So state two effects of acid drain. So first of all, acid drain, we see that it causes corrosion of iron and motor vehicles. So like at home, if you can look at uh, the Mabati, the iron, the iron roof, you'll notice that somewhat they are brown in color. So it's because of acid drain. So the acid drain caused by sulfur oxide, it causes corrosion of iron and motor vehicle parts. So apart from that, we see that acid drain, it leads to loss of chlorophyll in green plants as well. It leads to the leaching of minerals in the soil. So it leads to the process of leaching of minerals in the soil as well as withering of buildings, pollution of water, and decreasing of water and soil pH. So those are the, uh, are the, are the effects, are the results of acid drain. So it decreases the pH of water and soil. Decreasing meaning that the pH is, is going to come from being neutral and going towards the acidic side. So it's going to decrease the pH of soil and the pH of water. So let's go to the next question, which is C, uh, part C. So part C is asking, explain the term scrubbing of sulfur for oxide. So what does it mean by scrubbing of sulfur for oxide? So this basically is the removal of sulfur oxide from exhaust fumes by use of calcium hydroxide. So if you use calcium hydroxide to, use, to remove the sulfur oxide gas in the chimney or in the exhaust fumes, yeah, in the exhaust fumes found in the motor vehicles or around the chimney, so that process is the one which is called scrubbing. So for example, anytime you'll be asked or anytime you see scrubbing, just uh, just picture sulfur oxide, picture calcium hydroxide. So we are using calcium hydroxide to remove sulfur oxide gas from exhaust fumes. So that is what is referred to as scrubbing. Then question number five is asking, state the color of sulfur. It's yellow. Sulfur is yellow in color. That's the simplest question you'll ever get in an exam. State the color of sulfur. Sulfur is yellow in color. So apart from that, let's now go to question number six.
And question number six is asking, list the occurrences of sulfur. So this is asking, how, how is it that sulfur, how does sulfur occur in the environment? Uneza pataji sulfur. So list the occurrences of sulfur. So first of all, sulfur occurs as a free element. Apart from that, we'll see that it occurs in combined state. Like for example, we have hydrogen sulfide. So take note, each compound has a sulfur. So the combined state which you have hydrogen sulfide, we have metal sulfide, like for example, we have zinc sulfide. We have metal sulfates, like for example, we have uh, potassium sulfate. We have ion pyrites, we have copper pyrites, we have, they are very many. So it can occur as a free element that is only sulfur, or it can occur as combined state, which is an ele uh, like another element combined to sulfur, or in a compound as a whole. So apart from that, let's look at the next question, which is question number seven, and it's asking, define the term allotropy. So what is allotropy? So allotropy, simply, this, this is the existence of an element in different forms, but in the same state. So it's the existence of an element being in different forms, but in the same state. Like, for example, we have for sulfur. So we have the topic, let's give it, yeah, the topic, let's say the topic is sulfur. Then the forms, we have, uh, we have now... The first form, we have crystalline, we have amorphous. For the crystalline sulfur, we see we have two allotropes, and then the first allotrope, we have monoclinic, then we have rhombic. So you see, so our topic is sulfur, but inside the sulfur, we have other different forms of sulfur that we talked about. So allotropy basically means the existence of an element in the same state, which is sulfur, but in different Forms. So in these different forms, remember we say that we have the crystalline and the amorphous. For the crystalline forms, we have the rhombic sulfur, which is an allotrope, and then we have the monoclinic sulfur, which is the other allotrope of sulfur. So apart from that, let's now go to question number eight. So question number eight is asking, name two allotropes of sulfur and state their characteristic. So um, in high school, basically we deal with uh, the two types of sulfur, which is rhombic and monoclinic. We don't dwell so much on the, uh, on the amorphous sulfur, that is the colloidal, the plastic sulfur, the milk of sulfur. No. We mainly deal with rhombic sulfur and monoclinic sulfur. So in high school, we basically deal with these two. So the question is asking, name two allotropes of sulfur and state their characteristic. So the first one, we have rhombic sulfur. So for the rhombic sulfur, you see that it has octahedral shape. Apart from that, we see that it is stable below 96 degrees Celsius, and then it also has a density of 2.06 or 2.07 grams per centimeter cubed. So those are the characteristics of rhombic sulfur. So the next one is monoclinic sulfur. So for the monoclinic sulfur, you see that it has a long prism and needle-like shape. So that's the shape. Long prism, needle-like, hexagonal shape. So that is monoclinic. Apart from that, we'll see that it is stable above 96 degrees Celsius, and then it has a density of 1.98 grams per centimeter cubed. So that is the monoclinic sulfur. So let's go to question number nine. Explain how sulfur is extracted by using the frost process. Explain how sulfur is extracted by using the frost process. So for this frost process, remember we say that we have three different pipes. We have the outermost pipe, we have the innermost pipe, we have the middle pipe. So the outermost pipe, remember, superheated water, 170 degrees Celsius, 10 atmospheres. The inner pipe, remember, 15 atmosphere, hot air. The middle pipe, remember, extracting sulfur from underground up to the surface whereby sulfur, uh, sulfur will be extracted and placed inside, uh, inside large tanks for storage. So after that, let's go to question number 10. Question number 10 is asking, Name any non-crystalline forms of sulfur. So name any non-crystalline. So remember this question is tricky. This question has not asked directly, name the amorphous forms of sulfur. It has said, name any non-crystalline forms. So non-crystalline forms, it means that it, mean, it needs us to name the amorphous sulfur. So for the forms of sulfur, remember we say that we have two different forms, whereby sulfur is divided into crystalline, and the amorphous sulfur. For the crystalline sulfur, remember we say that we have the rhombic sulfur and then we have the monoclinic sulfur. For the amorphous sulfur, remember we say that uh, which are now the answers. 
For the amorphous sulfur or the non-crystalline, we have the plastic sulfur, we have the colloidal sulfur, and then we have the powder sulfur or milk of sulfur. So those are the amorphous sulfur whereby the question was asking. So those are the non-crystalline forms of sulfur. So apart from that, question number 11 is asking, state three uses of sulfur. These are very many, we'll just list a few. We have manufacturing of uh, sulfuric acid whereby we'll react sulfur with oxygen and then we'll get sulfur 4. Sulfur 4 oxide will be reacted with excess oxygen, we'll get sulfur 6. Sulfur 6 will be manipulated and reacted with water to get now sulfuric acid after getting now the oleum in the contact process. So the first one is manufacture of sulfuric acid. The next one is vulcanization or treating of rubber or making rubber to be hard. The next one is manufacturing of the different insecticides and fungicides and herbicides that we have. The other one is manufacturing of drugs. Apart from drugs, you can give another and say it is used in the manufacturing uh, manufacture of different bleaching agents. Like for example, we have GIC, ETC. It can also be used in the making of artificial colors. Yes, making of artificial colors and paints. Also, it can also be used in making of sulfur-6 oxide, which is a raw material in the contact process. Among others, there are different uses of sulfur, uh, of sulfur, which brings us to sulfur-4 oxide, which brings us to sulfur-6 oxide, etc. So question 12 is asking, what happens when sulfur reacts with nitric acid? So if we react sulfur with nitric acid, what will happen? So remember, in this process, sulfur is going to act as a reducing agent. Nitric acid is going to act as an oxidizing agent. But in this case, since we are being asked about sulfur, we are going to say sulfur is going to react as a reducing agent. So for the answer given to this question, we'll say that what happens when sulfur reacts with nitric acid? So the first one is brown gas of nitrogen oxide will be produced. And then uh, apart from that, we'll say sulfur will be oxidized to... Mm, sulfur will be oxidized to sulfuric acid and the nitric acid will be reduced to nitrogen 4 oxide gas. So that's exactly what will happen. So sulfur is going to be oxidized to sulfur 4 oxide. Nitric acid is going to be reduced to nitrogen 4 oxide gas. So apart from that, let's look at question number 13. And question number 13 is asking, state four uses of sulfur 4 oxide. Now remember, the other one was uses of sulfur. Now this one is state uses of sulfur 4 oxide. So the first use of sulfur oxide is that it acts as a bleaching agent, it acts as a fumigant, it acts as a food preservative, it helps in the manufacture of sulfuric acid, manufacture of sulfur 6 oxide, basically the same, same things are what we are just repeating here now and then. So question number 14 is asking, what happens when hydrogen sulfide is bubbled through solution of ion 3 chloride? So remember in the previous question we looked at the flowchart and the flowchart we reacted sulfur plus ion to get uh, ion 3 sulfide. Yeah, so we got ion 3 sulfide and then the experiment continued. So it's synonymous as this one. So this question is asking, what happens when hydrogen sulfide is bubbled through solution of ion 3 chloride? So first of all, we see that the brown ion 3 chloride will turn green color immediately. So the color of ion 3 chloride is going to turn green. So remember, ion 3 is always brown. Ion 2 is always green in color. So we have these two colors. Ion 3 is always uh, brown. Ion 3 is always green. So sulfur is going to reduce the ion 3 chloride from ion 3 chloride to ion 2 chloride, which is green in color. So it's going to reduce because sulfur has a very high reducing property uh, to reduce the to reduce the ion 3 chloride. But in this, uh, in this case, we are, being about, we are being asked about hydrogen sulfide. So since we are being asked about hydrogen sulfide, so the reaction is still going to be the same. So hydrogen sulfide is still going to reduce the ion 3 chloride from being ion 3 chloride to being ion 2 chloride. So as you can look at the, uh, the reaction, we have ion 3 chloride reacting with hydrogen sulfide. We're going to get ion 2 chloride plus hydrochloric acid plus sulfur. So that is exactly what is going to happen. So let's now look at question number 15. So question number 15 is asking what observations are made in the setup? So in this setup, remember, and as you can see, we are reacting hydrogen sulfide and we are bubbling hydrogen sulfide inside sulfuric acid, a beaker which is full of sulfuric acid. 
So what is really going to happen is that we are going to obtain yellow deposits of sulfur in the beaker. So the answer to that is we are going to obtain yellow deposits of sulfur in the beaker. As you can look at the reaction, when hydrogen sulfide reacts with sulfuric acid, we're going to get uh, four molecules of sulfur and four molecules of water. So in this experiment, some particles or solid particles of sulfur are going to be deposited on the top layers of the liquid. Yeah, so we are going to see some yellow deposits of sulfur. So question number 16 is asking, zinc reacts with sulfur to form zinc sulfide, whereby 16.2 grams of zinc reacted with 10 grams of sulfur. And then the first question is asking, write the chemical reaction for this equation. So we are reacting zinc with sulfur. So if 16.2 grams of zinc reacted with 10 grams of sulfur, so we are going to get zinc sulfide. So remember, the, uh, the atomic mass, the relative atomic mass of zinc, or the atomic mass of zinc is 65. For sulfur, the atomic mass is 32. So automatically in an exam, if you see that you have been given the masses of elements, always know that you might be asked calculation of moles, you must be asked, you may, <laughs> not you must, you may be asked empirical formula, calculation of moles, etc. So in this case, the mass of zinc is 65, the mass of sulfur is 32. But now we have been told that 16.2 grams of zinc are the one that reacted. 10 grams of sulfur are the ones that reacted. So let's go to question number two. So question number two is asking, calculate the number of moles of zinc atom that reacted. So the formula for calculating the moles, we know that moles, for you to calculate moles, we say that uh, grams divided by the relative atomic mass is equal to the number of moles. So let's begin with zinc. So for zinc, we have been given that the mass is 16.2 grams. The relative atomic mass of zinc is equal to 65 grams. So if we say 16.2 grams divided by 65, we are going to get the moles of zinc that reacted. So the moles of zinc that reacted are 0 0.25 moles of zinc that reacted. So those were the only moles of zinc that reacted as per the question. So question C is asking, calculate the moles of sulfur that reacted. So how many moles of sulfur reacted? So if you look at the, the equation, we have zinc reacting with sulfur. We get zinc sulfide. So the mole ratio in this experiment will be 1 is to 1. So that is the mole ratio. We can use the mole ratio to, uh, to calculate the moles of sulfur that reacted. So we'll use the mole ratio. So the mole ratio is 1 is to 1 is to 1. Therefore, the moles of sulfur that reacted in this experiment will automatically also be 1. Because 1 mole of zinc contains 0 0.25 moles that reacted. If the mole ratio is 1 is to 1, it will mean that if we have one mole of sulfur that reacted with zinc being one mole at 0 0.25 moles, it will mean that also the moles of sulfur that reacted was 0 0.25 moles. So the moles of sulfur that reacted in this experiment were also 0 0.25 moles. So the question D uh, to that will be, find the mass of sulfur that reacted in this experiment. So find the mass of sulfur that reacted in this experiment. So the formula for calculating mole, we know that mole is equal to mass divided by the relative atomic mass. So let's make now the mass to be the subject of the formula. So if we make mass to be subject of the formula, we'll say that mass is equal to moles times relative atomic mass. So that's the formula for calculating the mass. So mass is equal to moles times relative atomic mass. Therefore, the moles of sulfur that reacted were 0 0.25 moles. So 0 0.25 moles were the one reacted, but what, like, what is the relative atomic mass of sulfur? So the relative atomic mass of sulfur is equal to 32 grams. So for us to get the mass of sulfur that reacted, we'll say that 0 0.25 times 32 is how many grams? So it is 8 grams. So it is only 8 grams of sulfur of the 10 grams that reacted. So remember, we used 10 grams of sulfur to react with zinc. So of the 10 grams, it is only 8 grams of sulfur that reacted with the zinc. So that is that in this experiment. So for sulfur, we used 10 grams. Yes, we used 10 grams of sulfur. But of the 10 grams, it is only and only 8 grams that reacted as per the calculations that you have just made. So the mass of sulfur that reacted in this experiment was only 8 grams. So let's go to question number 17, and it's asking, below is a diagram to prepare sulfur for 
oxide. So below is a diagram to prepare sulfur for oxide. So we are using uh, dilute hydrochloric acid and calcium or rather sodium sulfate. So we're using uh, hydrochloric acid and sodium sulfate. So question A is asking, write an equation for the reaction. So an equation between hydrochloric acid and sodium sulfate. So you're going to get sodium chloride, sulfur oxide, and water molecules. So that is what you're going to get in this, uh, in this reaction. So before you go to question number two, look, we have sulfuric acid. And I told you, anytime you'll see gas being passed through sulfuric acid, always know that conch, sulfuric acid is acting as a dehydrating agent. So this acid is dehydrating or removing water vapor from, uh, from the atmosphere. It is removing water vapor. So let's go to question number B first of all. So B is asking, say the method used in the gas uh, collection. So this method is downward delivery of gas, whereby gas is coming from the top side and being deposited downwards. So why is it that sulfur oxide is being collected using this method? First of all, sulfur oxide is a denser gas. It is heavier than oxygen. So since it's denser and heavier than oxygen, that's why it's being collected using the downward delivery method of gas. So the other name of downward delivery method, it can also be called upward displacement of air. That's the other name. So it can be called downward delivery or upward displacement of air. So that is the other name of the downward delivery. So question let us see is, is asking, state the functions of conch sulfuric acid. So the function of the conch sulfuric acid is to dehydrate or remove water vapor from the atmosphere or from the experiment. So the function is to remove water from the gas which is being collected. Anytime you'll see a gas being passed through concentrated, and you should take note, it should not be dilute hydrochloric acid. Uh, sulfuric acid rather. It must be concentrated sulfuric acid, which is being used to remove water vapor from uh, the gas which is being collected. <laughs>